And we are live. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today and all you folks out there in Zoom. Uh, it's good to see you here. Um, yeah, we're going to be digging into some really interesting stuff today. Talking about <laughs> interesting in quotes, only because it involves potentially free money. Uh, we're going to be digging into the the something the the government passed, the U.S. government passed last week. Um, they passed a big, you know, two trillion dollar relief bill for COVID nineteen, uh, you know, damages and and all that stuff that's being caused by that. And we're just digging into a particular piece of that today called the Paycheck Protection Program because it applies. Um, you know, pretty solidly to startups and consultants and freelancers, folks like yourself um, in, in the audience. And we do know that there's, you know, the bill was 800 pages. And so, uh, you know, Aynor Volset took it upon himself to um, spend the better part of his weekend reading hundreds and hundreds of pages. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, you know, I'm going to intro myself and then and then I'll kind of get into to bringing the panelists in. But uh, you may know me as Rob Walling, and that's good because that's my actual name. I'm the co-founder of MicroConf, and um, uh, you know I'm glad to be here hosting today and uh, kind of bring in you know be able to 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 use some of our time and and resources to help educate on on this topic. Um, today we're going to you know run for close to an hour, depending on how many questions we have. Um, I'm going to do some introductions here with uh, Brennan and Anar and then uh, ask them some opening questions. Um, we'll do a few polls during the course of the hour just to you know, hear how, how people are feeling and um, get some sentiment there, and then do an overview, and then dig into questions. We've had some pre-submitted questions. I think we had six or seven, and we'll run through some of those as you all are thinking and, and asking your questions in the Zoom room, um, because right now, uh, the, you know, there's about a 20, 30, 30 second delay in the, um, in the stream. And so, um, you can, uh, oh, sorry, my audio is going out. Um, anyway, so there's a, there's a delay in the stream. So we have some questions there to, uh, to feed it and hopefully we'll be able to get to everything. Obviously, if not, um, you know, you can keep asking questions and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. So before we dive in, um, I'd love to introduce, uh, my panelists down here, Brennan Dunn, co-founder of Right Message and of Double Your Freelancing. Hey, he's right. Hey, Brent, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. Okay, cool. I wasn't sure if, if you want me to introduce myself. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, happy to be here. First off, thanks for inviting me. Um, I think the, the color that I can bring to the table today is, uh, first off, I know nothing about what Einar is going to be digging into. Um, but that being <laughs> said, I did uh, the, you know, I was uh, scaling an agency back in 2008 during our last big kind of hiccup um economic hip, hiccup so that's the context i'm going to bring to the table um in terms of w how we can compare this to then um some of the things i think especially solo freelancers or small agency owners should be thinking about and should be planning for um so but i'm i'm also as an attendee i'm, I'm really excited to see what gets discussed today and also more importantly how um those of us who could or should be looking at potentially some government help uh, with all this. What are our options? What are the limitations and so on? Um, so yeah, like Rob said, I'm a, a co-founder of a company called Right Message. Um, but my uh, my older business, I should say, is a now a 50,000 person plus community of freelancers and agencies. So um, I've been kind of in the in the consulting space for a while now, and I'm just, again, happy to be here, and, and hopefully I can bring some uh, um, potentially much needed advice to the table, especially if you're if you're looking to finally go out on your own, or you are on your own, and you're kind of unsure about, are my clients all going to pull? Um, how do I get clients with, since I can't leave the house, <laughs> you know, things like that. So yeah, that's me. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today, sir. Mm -hmm. And as as Brennan said, um, you know he and I are not the experts um, on this this bill. Anar is the one who has dug through it, so he will be doing a lot of the um, a lot of the you know the question answering. But uh, I, I know for one, I have a lot of questions, and I think Brennan does as well around how this applies to startups and consultants and such. Um, Anar Volset, co-founder of Tiny Seed. You want to say a little bit about yourself and why you decided to read hundreds of pages of government legislation? <laughs> Just, What's just wrong? for fun. It's like yeah. I got nothing. I got nothing better to do. I'm sort of a. It's an excuse to hide from my children over the over the week. Um, yeah. So, like I said, co-founder of of Tiny Seed, and you know, obviously, we've seen some of our portfolio companies take, 
you know, a pretty significant impact on it, um, you know, and quickly realized that um, there was a lot of misinformation about the, the actual bailout package that was being sent through, because I think people were used to sort of the 2008 bailout package, which, you know, if you were a freelancer or if you were a, sort of a small, small U.S. business, you didn't really get much benefit from it, you know, other than the fact that, you know, the, the financial system <laughs> didn't collapse. But there wasn't any, like, it was very clearly not designed for you versus it became evident to me uh, last week, early last week, that this was something that, you know, a lot more small businesses should be aware of. So that's why I decided to dig through it. And, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. But, but the, the main purpose I did it was because I think there was just isn't a lot of awareness out there that this is something that applies to, to many more people than they think. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought it up because I really, I knew the, the bill had passed, the $2 trillion um, you know, stimulus bill, but I had no idea. I, I never think that startups or, or consultants or freelancers or whatever you want to, you know, however you want to group us um, are, are eligible for these things. And I don't know that we ever have been in the past. It's typically like, uh, you know, big banks, you know, and big pharma and big... Uh, too big to fail. You know. Yeah. Too big to fail. So, That's what you want to be. Not too small yeah. to fail. Right. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, yeah, to echo, you know, Anar's uh, disclaimer, none of us here are lawyers. Like, please, you can't consider this legal advice or direct advice. You should consider your own circumstances and do your own research before making any kind of decision regarding these programs. But um, certainly we're here to just try to give you information and, and help you along. So I want to start with uh, an opening question uh, for Brennan. I'm curious, you know, as someone who, you know, was was freelancer consultant and ran an agency um, and, and during the last recession, in essence, because there are a lot of, a lot of components to this, right? Um, I'm wondering, like, if you had one or two key recommendations for that you would give an agency owner or a freelancer right now in terms of surviving the next six to 12 months. Yeah, so I think that the big thing to keep in mind is rarely are things ever binary. It's not like it's going to be either economy or no economy. Um, things might get certain industries are going to be hit harder, especially if, let's say, you've always worked with travel companies or something like that inevitably you're going to need to start thinking about how do I potentially expand my client base and diversify. But one thing that I found was when, I don't know, I know in the service sector, like with, you know, people who work at restaurants and everything, the layoffs have already happened. I'm not sure if and when that will happen for like in-house designers, in-house developers and so on. But one thing that helped uh, me at least as an agency owner, and freelancer back in 2008 was work actually got easier to get because a lot of companies still had projects that needed to get, to, to get done, but they were either reluctant to hire somebody full time because that's a big commitment or they couldn't afford somebody full time. So in a way, this could be beneficial to many of us um, if we're going after potentially uh, you, you know problems that could be solved either in-house or externally through hiring a freelancer. So that's one thing, again, I think it's too early to predict how things will go there. Um, because I don't know about you guys, but I haven't heard too many people, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong, maybe again, I'm just have my head in the sand, but I know a lot of the people who I think are struggling work-wise are the ones who are working in like retail or like brick and mortar retail or, um, you know, like uh, restaurants or something like that. I just don't know if it's hit kind of bigger, um, bigger is the wrong word, but, but more, you know, more in house like positions, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, what I would be looking at now would be the argument I like to make is if assume that most businesses plan to survive, um, and they plan to hopefully thrive through this and that the big risk again, for any person in a, in a hiring position is, Am I going to be committed now to having this fixed expense, namely a an employee? Um, and can I can I stomach that? So I think like the thing that I would be trying to think about is how can I go and approach a company and say, I can help you with XYZ and really anchor your costs or your services against what an, a single in-house person or maybe a small team of in-house people um, would respectively cost, right? So Think about ways that, um, you know, with, with the network that hopefully you've already established, uh, whether it be if you're a developer, maybe software companies, SaaS companies, whatever. Um, if you're a designer, again, like you should know this, but um, think about like, how can you go to a company that might be struggling to retain uh, full-time salaries or might be blocked currently from 
growing the way they thought they would grow this year and think through ways that you can put together either packaged offerings or one-off one-off offerings that can help them that can that can legitimately keep them you know keep them going i mean if you're like a facebook advertiser right now facebook ads are dirt cheap so how can you go and potentially if you're a marketer go and help companies who might have wanted to do this before they're struggling now to grow and and maybe you could come in and kind of save the day for them um but i think at the end of the day i'm just again i'm all i can do is anchor this against my experience from a decade ago but i know for me i was really worried about things like seeing the stock market drop and the the big recession word of the you know the, what starting with the subprime mortgage fallout and then like just the market tanking and everything else 12 years ago um i was thinking okay th this means like my nascent business is over but i did start to kind of realized by accident that a lot of companies still needed to get stuff done, but they were very reluctant to bring in in-house full-time personnel. So could be good if you can set yourself up in a position to do that. I think nowadays more than ever, now's the time to create authority, to, to write, to blog, to really showcase your expertise. You can't go to networking events. You can't go to conferences to do that. Um, you're going to need to find other avenues of doing that. So um, this, this should be the time to be thinking about how do I go and get myself in front of new audiences through maybe guest posting or podcasting or whatever that might be to really establish a foothold for your brand, for you and, and what it is you offer the world? Um, initially to a small subset of people who look up to you as an authority and hopefully over time kind of expand that. So I think, um, you know, that that would be that's obviously more of a long term play that doesn't usually have immediate ROI. Um, but we all have a lot more time on our hands nowadays. So I'd be looking at um, how you can start doing that if you're not doing that yet. Sounds good. Thanks, sir. And Anar, before we dig into the the PPP, as they call it, um, any recommendations yep. you have for, you know, you've been giving to companies to advise them about the next three, six, 12 months? Um, I think like the type of companies I advise tend to be software companies and a lot of them are tied to specific industries and some of those industries are tanking. <laughs> so those guys, and for those guys, it's a matter of survival. Um, but I think that's probably also the case for, for a lot of the sort of kind of not maybe directly hit industries and, and, and companies that are providing software to those kind of companies. Um, um, I think like basically if, if you have a growth plan, I don't think it's, uh, you know, for the for the next year, I don't think it's unrealistic to say that you can basically assume there'll be almost no growth in uh, in Q2, uh, and, and maybe a slight decline, and then cut your you know cut your growth projections for for Q3 and Q4 probably by you know half fifty percent. That that'll probably end up where you need to be. Um, and I think in that case, like it's a matter of survival. Like you should, it's, it's people are because it's because of the uncertainty and because people don't know how long this will last, how long this, how, how bad it'll be. Um, people are going to be cutting, you know, software. They're going to be cutting non-essential things or downgrading or, or doing all sorts of things that will is likely to impact an awful lot of software businesses. Uh, and I think just prepare for that and don't expect that things will just go, you know, as normal. Okay, thanks. And we have some. Uh some um, stuff in the chat as well as some questions being submitted. That's that's awesome. Um, so David Heller actually said that there are lots of layoffs in software businesses already. It's mostly software companies that are serving restaurants, travel, hospitality, <laughs> events, and they've taken a big hit, which is which is understandable. Um, and uh, let's see. And then we have a couple questions. So if if you want to start submitting questions, I will be monitoring this as we go through. Um, I think a couple things I will um, mention as guidance is, the, like, it, it's really hard for us to give specific exact advice. And frankly, we probably shouldn't give exact advice about your exact numbers and your exact calculations and such because it just uh, a it's not applicable to everyone, and b it just takes a long time to even. Um, you know, to even get into it and, and get the right answers. So more general questions are better, but we do understand, you know, there are going to be questions about part-time work and about what if I have multiple sources of income, you know, 1099 W2, all that we, we have already. Um, but there are some good questions coming through and you can submit them in uh, in the Zoom room Q&A and just, just add it in. Um, so with this, yeah, uh, let's see, anonymous attendee asked, we are all muted, correct? Uh, and that is correct. Um, so you are, I'm getting rid of that. 
let's do a little overview before I dig into these as well as the ones that were submitted in advance. Um, let's do a quick poll of the attendees. It looks like there are what well, there are about 350 people in here. So the first poll that producer Xander is gonna send out to y'all is what is your employee head count? And this will just give us an idea of um, you know how many folks. I'm actually gonna fill the poll out too. So it'll take about um, 30 to 60 seconds to get results from that. So while we do that, I will um, bounce over to to Anar and you know we'll talk a little bit about the, this bill in general just to get everyone on the same page. So as I mentioned a few times, the government passed a two trillion dollar stimulus package last week. There are a bunch of loans, there are grants, there's money going in all over the place, um, and we don't have time to cover all that obviously. But you know, with Anar having read through all of this, he's summarized several of the plans and and the um, kind of the programs that apply to our types of small you know, the startups, consultants, and freelancers. If you go to microconf.com slash latest, you'll see a big summary of the COVID-19 relief stuff. And one of those programs is the PPP, which is the payroll um, protection program that we'll be talking about today. Again, reiterating, he's not a lawyer, we're not lawyers, but you know that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, so I, I think my first question is, the PPP technically, Anar, is it's not a grant, it's loans, correct? Can you describe kind of how the mechanics of it work? Yeah, there was some <clears throat> there was some back and forth about exactly how this was supposed to be done. And obviously it could have been done in a number of different ways. But um so the PPP was part of the, the actually the third relief bill. And um what it how it was structured was to go through and expand the existing SBA seven A type loan to to basically open it up to make it much easier to get. And um, the way that it works is you effectively f go with uh, a lender. Initially, it has to be an SBA approved lender, but they're saying that they're going to let pretty much any FDIC insured bank in the US uh, do these kind of loans. And it's 100% backed by the government, which means that the banks will be, you know, pretty keen to, to lend. Um, and the uh, uh, the 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 guidance from Treasury just came out that says it's going to be a two-year loan, and the interest rate is going to be 0.5 percent, and everyone's getting to get the same terms. So you, you're you're not going to get any benefit by going to a different bank. Like you know, there's no competition between banks here. Um, the way that it works is you go in and you say, okay, um, I provide documentation that shows here's my average monthly payroll over the last trailing 12 months, and you can get a loan up to two and a half times that amount, and if you make if you if you get the loan which you're likely to get in most cases um if you had payroll over the last 12 months then um for the eight weeks after that uh that loan has been originated um if you keep documentation of how you're spending the proceeds in terms and uh, and you spend that on specific things that is listed in in the law which is, includes things basically as payroll um then you get forgiveness for the loan. So if you take two and a half months worth of payroll and then you spend two and a half months and just run the same numbers through, you should get 100% forgiveness. Awesome. And there, are, uh, let's see, a couple of questions coming through. Someone said, um, it, does this apply? Well, this is just a general question that I have. It's like, okay, so if I have W-2 employees, it's around that. What if I am paying 1099 contractors um, does that count? So, um, if you are paying 1099 contractors right now, I think it counts, but I'm not sure. Um, and, and actually, the law guidance, itself, right? Yeah, they have not big. provided guidance yet, and they're saying that you know on on Friday the first the banks are going to start lending, which I think would be quite surprising if they make that mm -hmm. happen. Um, but but it's sort of people are still hedging on that question because the actual mm -hmm. wording on the law is quite. Um, is is quite unclear. My thinking would be that yes, you'd probably be able to count it, but from a high level perspective, I can see why the SBA might decide against it. Because if you think about it, okay, if you're if you're paying money to you get a you get a grant or, or a loan, and you pay it to the employee, the employee can't then also go and claim you know hey I want you know my 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 uh, my paycheck. Uh, you know, an additional fee for my paycheck. But if you have a scenario where, like, okay, I'm a, I'm a, you know, an LLC. I have an independent contractor. I get a grant to cover your the payment to you, but you're a sole proprietor and you're also under this law. So, in, technically speaking, you could then go get your own loan for exactly the amount of money. That's, so, I think, a piece. Yeah, that 
that I've been confused by as well. And I, it, yeah. it seems like they haven't given guidance, guidance on that yet, right? They just, they just haven't, and they haven't really made up their mind, I think. <laughs> and exactly, yeah. they, it's so vague that it's basically up to bureaucrats of how they're going to pull it off. And I think it'll, it'll come down to, you know, how big uptake do you think they'll get? Are they going to run out of money sooner or later? Do they actually just want to, are they looking just to do more stimulus? And obviously, like, if that's what they want to do, if they want to juice, if the bureaucrats decide they want to juice the stock market, chances are they'll say yes, because that just puts more money out there. Uh, if right. they decide to be a little bit more conservative, they, they, I think they'll probably say no. Right. All so right. If you're, if you're a company of one, could I ask one quick, quick question? If you're a company of Please. one, so let's say you're a freelancer and you have either an S Corp or an LLC, hmm. Is the bank going to be doing any sort of due diligence to ensure that, like, can it be just for your own benefit as the sole person yes. in this business? It can. Okay. Yes, it so can. it's not, yes. it's not about really maintaining uh, income for a team. It can be just for a company of no. one. Correct. Okay. Yes. And that's actually true for, um, I believe, for the EIDL, which is the, the loan that was passed in the second stimulus bill uh, a while mm. back. You, yep. You're allowed and to use regular payroll, basically, which includes you. Yep. Do you know if folks, there's a bunch of questions around, um, you know, I, I don't take W2, I, I, I run an S Corp and I take distributions, not, you know, not uh, actual W2 payroll. Do you know if that counts? I think it does. I certainly would believe if you do it as what's called guaranteed payments, then, then I think there's a very strong argument that it's covered. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised if it boils down to like, okay, which part of the draw are you paying self-employment taxes on? Or like what because there's always in the US there's always some sort of an employer t or employer or employee tax on the, the amount that, that goes out like it's not like you're gonna avoid that just by doing a draw and I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's how they determine what's a what's what is your salary and what is just a, a, a distribution like a profit distribution right cool and there there have been several questions about like do you have to demonstrate a direct impact that your revenue has gone down or something yeah. because of COVID no, you don't. Um, you actually just have to say, and I can look at specifically here, you basically just have to say, you have to make a good faith certification that the uncertainty of current economic conditions make necessary the loan request to support the ongoing operations and the funds will be used to retain workers, maintain payroll, or to make mortgage lease and utility payments. Yep. So there's no like, there they won't dig in and say, okay, prove to me that you've taken a hit. That's not the intent. Right, right. Cool. Um, Producer Xander, can we pull up those poll results of, uh, let's see, what was my question again? Uh, what is your employee headcount? And it is 37% solo, 39% two to five employees. So between those two, it's almost 80% uh, um, of folks. So, and then let's see, 11%, six to 10, and then it's the rest, you know, 11 and up is uh, about 12% of the remaining audience. So a lot of, a lot of small folks in here, as we would expect. Um, let's call up the next poll question. How will spending at your company shift during the next three months? So just take a couple seconds to fill that out. Um, and we'll come back to those results in a few minutes. So, okay. So, Anar, you need to have, uh, you need to be located in the U.S. If you have an LLC or an S corp or a C corp, it needs to be obviously located in the U.S. Um, Correct, if, and you can if, be a sole proprietor too. It, it does. You don't right. actually so don't, you don't need, actually to need have an entity. An entity no. Awesome, and that's the thing I think a lot of people are are confused about. Like, there's people taking 1099 income directly to their Schedule C on their taxes. They don't have an entity. They're basically sole proprietor, um, and you know that that works. Okay, so what if there's a couple of situations I want to throw at you here. So let's say I have a Delaware, you know, LLC, but I live abroad. I'm a U.S. citizen, but I live abroad with my family, you know, in uh, in Europe for whatever reason. Do so, I, yeah, again, so you're a U.S. business, so that's that's a that's a qualifier. You're not you you can't be a foreign entity, obviously. Um, the the employee part of it and again this boils down to the unclarity in my view about the you know employees versus uh you know contractor or sole proprietors and for employees if you're an employee of the company you have to be mostly resident in the u.s to count so if you have employees including yourself who live abroad and you're paid as an employee that does not count but again the law is very unclear around as i see it anyway around does that also apply to contractors i would 
I would I would expect so. I would be very surprised if the you know the guidance comes out that says yes, we can't play, pay employers employees of U.S. companies abroad, but we are okay with sending money to contractors that companies send abroad. That would be surprising to me, but right. it could be. <laughs> Yep. And someone had a question about part-time employees. Most of my employees are part-time. Let's assume W-2 part-time. Um, does it make any specification about full-time versus part-time? So a lot of the time it refers to this notion of full-time equivalent employee. And uh, the, the, the direct answer is I don't know whether it's disqualified. There certainly seems to be most of the guidance I've read seem to suggest that part-time is fine. Um, and it just, you know, you just count as if, you know, you've, whatever the payroll is for that part-time person. But, but that I'm really not sure about. And I don't, I don't think a lot of people are. Got it. And how about um, non-US? Let's say um, I run, again, a Delaware LLC. I'm, I'm the owner and I take W-2 payroll. I live here in the States. All that makes sense. I can you know, look at applying for that. What if I have a W-2 or a 1099 contractor that is in Canada or is in Europe? If does foreign employees or, do foreign employees or contractors count? Foreign employees do not count. And like I said, okay. contract, foreign contractors probably don't. Right. Okay, cool. And what is the salary? There's like a salary cap, right, of 100000 How does that work? But it's not, it's not if you make above 100000 you can't apply it's that, or can't include yourself. You can just only include up to $100,000 of your income. Is that right? That's correct. That, okay. I, I, that's my belief. So, so I think basically, and that's true for, for uh, payments to yourself as well. So you can get the loan amount, and so be aware, and this actually tripped me up a bit too. There's a difference in what is used in order to calculate the total amount of loan that you can get, and then there's a, a different thing, number of things you, you're allowed to use that the loan for, and then there's another set of things that you get forgiveness for. So mm -hmm. make sure that you understand the difference between those two, three, because that, that tripped me up uh, initially. Yep, yep. Could I ask you a quick right. question about um, about uh, just a hypothetical? So let's say you you have more than one company. Would um, I mean conceivably could you walk into the bank with application one, get it, walk back in a second later with application two, and is it is it tied? I guess what I'm getting at is is this tied to the individual recipient, or is it tied to the tax the organization? Um, meaning if I'm employed for two different companies simultaneously, is that a no-go or it, I, I'm sure you get what I'm trying to get out of here, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I actually, I'm not sure. I think, I, I think for each entity you, you can apply effectively. It's the entity that matters. And it's like, what does the entity have as payroll that mm -hmm. qualifies? And the fact that there's you, the individuals, say, say, because in theory, you could be, you know, Jack Dorsey, right? So should Jack Dorsey not be allowed? Well, if they were smaller companies, but like he's CEO of Twitter and Square. Um, it, it wouldn't really make sense to me that, that neither of those two companies would qualify just because they happen to have the same CEO. Now, is it a good idea for the same guy to be CEO of these two companies? No, I don't think so. But that's beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> right. And... Um... To follow up on that, one of the qualifications for this is you have to be less than you have to have less than 500 employees. Right? Correct. We mentioned yes. that top, or you, you may have mentioned it. I was busy. I'm, I'm, there's a lot of questions, so I'm trying to get through. In fact, if you're if you're typing questions into the chat in Zoom, please put them. In, there's a special Q and A section in this in this software, and that allows me to mark them as answered, so I don't have to like flip through. So if you, if you can load them in there, that's the best. I don't. I mean, we have 58 open questions right now, plus a bunch of the chat. So I don't imagine we're going to get through all of them. But let's let's do a little bit of work. Um, all right, sole proprietor. Yeah, he said, I'm a sole proprietor. I'm guessing there's a 50% chance that my upcoming contracts fall through, but they haven't yet. That doesn't matter. Am I still? eligible i mean it, it, again he has to certify that he believes the current you know it's that sentence you ad, answered before right or you said before yeah, yeah. cool um uh, and then so a couple of people are asking the e so there's the ppp which is really what we're focused on here but a couple of people are asking yep. about the eidl um yep. and the eidl there's both a ten thousand dollar grant and then there's a loan is that right you want to give 60 seconds on that so people understand <laughs> what those are Sure. So the EIDL was part of the second relief bill, which expanded um, emergency disaster loans to, to cover 
this area. Basically, these are not forgivable loans, except with the exception of the this 10k grant. What it is is um, it's up to two million. Uh, the interest rate is 3.75. I think it's amortized over 30 years. The difference with the EIDL is that you have to, um, I, at least the way the law has been written, is that you have to document um, you have to document the uh, actual the, the actual loss itself in order to qualify for the loan. Now, that being said, they seem to be from the people that I've sort of heard about who've actually gotten the loan or gone through the process. They seem to be saying that you can get a loan of uh, one to six months of gross profit in the 12 months prior to January 31st. And and again, this doesn't actually, this is not a grant. This is not the same as the PPP. You're not going to get that, right. but it's, it's potentially no forgiveness. A, a, right. Yeah. It's potentially a much larger loan and it's under really nice terms. Like there's no prepayment penalty. Um, you can you can get it based on your own credit score. If it's less than two hundred thousand, there's no personal guarantee, which is not usually the case with the SBA. Now, in the the third relief bill, which is where they passed the PPP, they also added this EIDL grant, and so they've changed the process now such that if you apply for the EIDL, at the end of the application, there is a checkbox that says, "I would also like to be considered for the ten thousand uh, dollar EIDL grant." And then they actually ask for your bank account number and your routing number. And then if you get, they send it, and then they're supposed to, within three days, send you $10,000. You know, And if you don't get accepted for the EIDL, that turns into a grant. And so that's essentially $10,000 free dollars. Now, you can, there's been some confusion around whether you have to pick the EIDL or the PPP. That's not the case. You can do both. You can apply for the EIDL right now, you can check the box, get a $10,000 grant, and you can get or not get the loan, depending on uh, your circumstances. And then you can also apply for the PPP. Now, if you get the PPP, then the $10,000 grant will be deducted from your loan forgiveness. Got it. Okay, good. That's that was a question right. someone else asked, is they said they've already submitted the EIDL, and you know, are they eligible for PPP? And you're saying you can, you can do them. Uh, you can do both. both. You don't need to mess with you. If you qualify for the EIDL, there's no reason not to do it, the PPP. Now, the one caveat there is, excuse me, is that you're you're not allowed to use the it for the same stuff. So you mm -hmm. can't use the EIDL money for the payroll and then use the PPP money for the same payroll at least at the same time. And certainly mm -hmm. you, then you won't get certainly won't get loan forgiveness. So so it's worth how, if you're if you're going to get both it's worth strategizing around what are the allowable uses for the EIDL and what are the allowable and forgivable uses for the PPP and make sure you optimize that. that you, mentioned, nice. uh, you mentioned 12 months of payroll. Does that mean that for to be eligible, a company needs to be at least a year old or is there any sort of age requirement for this? Yeah, there's there there's actually there is some age requirements, but there is a special provision that says if your if your business wasn't in operation between February fifteenth, two thousand nineteen, and January thirtieth, two thousand nineteen, then you can elect to have the payroll average be the January and February of this year. Okay, just to clarify, because I think you said that I think you were off. So you said February of twenty nineteen to January of twenty twenty. Is that correct? Not not January. No. February 15th okay. of 2019 to yep. June 30th, 2019. June 30th, 2019. That's, that's right, that considered, was in 2020, that's considered the, the covered period. That's uh, the period that, that, they, that they look at. Yeah, because there's a bunch of questions about, like folks are saying, hey, I just hired a contractor or an employee in the last two months. You know, But let's say I've been in business for three years and I hired someone in the last two months. Do, does their payroll count for this? Or are, are you looking yes. back at the first six months of last year? They count the, t the, the 12 months prior to when the loan, I think either application was made or loan was originated. And you okay. can apply from pretty much whenever they open it until the end of the covered period, so June 30th. So in theory, you could wait, you could hire a bunch of people, you could wait until June 29th, apply, and then the average would count your new payroll, uh, your new total payroll cost. However, Keep in mind that these money run out, <laughs> yep. and I don't think there'll be money left. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. I don't first come, first serve. Yeah. yeah. And they're not taking applications yet. What have we heard about when applications open? Because I'm guessing there's going to be a huge rush to get applications in. Yeah, the Treasury just yesterday actually issued guidance saying starting April 3rd, small businesses and sole proprietorships can apply. And then starting April, 20, April 10th, independent contractors and self-employed individuals can apply. And these are both through existing SBA lenders. And as it says, other regulated lenders will be available to make these loans as soon as they are approved. But given how quick banks work, I would not expect that to <laughs> yeah. happen a lot. I mean, is this a matter so of, I know we're supposed to be social distancing, but showing up at a branch or is, are banks rolling out like online forms for this or? They basically put out the Paycheck Protection Program application form. Um, and I would expect it to be like a, an email upload. Tell me know. it's PDFs. Tell me it's oh, PDFs. I know they don't have this online. <laughs> yeah. Of course it's PDFs. Come on. No, it's PDFs. Oh my gosh. All right. A uh, producer <laughs> better Dander... that than having a crashing than having a crashing website that nobody can access. That's true. That's true. At least you can do it on your own time. Uh, producer Xander, can we bring the results up for the previous poll? How will spending at your company shift during the next three months? Ooh. Let's see if that comes up. Um, uh oh no, that's the other poll. That's what is your employee headcount? No, I see the one. No, I see it. Yeah, oh, do you? Yeah, Where? Yeah, yeah, the right one. What are the results? It's, they're uh, not. Oh, good. there they are. I'm not not fun. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. Good. Thirty. There you go. Thirty-six percent decreasing by more than twenty percent. Oof. Thirty-one uh, percent decreasing between one and twenty percent. Staying the same about a quarter, about twenty-five percent. Eight, only 8% 8 expect their business to increase. So, um, and it looks like, what is that, about 60, so about two thirds are expecting a decrease basically of some kind. So that's, that's expected. I want to know these four super optimists. Yeah. I know, I like, you're in the right, well, there's Zoom, so we have the CEO of Zoom in here, and we have the Slack, Stuart Butterfield is in here. Uh, I mean, the, the remote work stuff is, is certainly, you know, gonna, gonna do okay. Can you, can we run through a super quick example of like, let's say, again, I have a Delaware LLC, I pay myself W2, $120,000 a year. I can only, my under, tell me if this is right or wrong, I'll do the analysis. Um, I can only apply for, you know, payroll against 100,000 of that. So that is, I believe that's $8,333. Yep. Correct. So 100K divided by eight, about divided by 12. Um, math live on the internet. So I have, yeah, 8,333. And then if you multiply that times 2.5, because it's 2.5 months of payroll, that's $20,833. Is that loosely what, in this hypothetical example, what I'd be asking for? Plus sales and local taxes, health benefits, insurance premiums, retirement benefits. Uh, okay. Like there's a bunch of stuff around there. Like it's the fully loaded yeah. payroll costs. It's the so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and like I said, if, if contractors count as well, then that might be even higher. But yeah, that's the, that's the general gist. Got it. Okay. There's a question. Uh, I started working full time on my startup in August of 2019. I was planning to start taking a salary this May, but the current situation, you know, I, I definitely can't do that. Since I've not started taking a salary, you know, am I eligible for a PPP or for PPP? Um, yeah, I would think I that would be very hard. I think it would be hard to justify. It's also okay to say like, we, we're not sure. Like you, I, I, I'm, I'm just gonna say I'm and, not sure, but I'm pretty yeah. sure that no. <laughs> yeah. Ultimately, the arbiter of this is what the U.S. government. It's the SBA. It's the banks. And the, and the I mean, banks themselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. What if I hire people back and then eventually have to let people go later because we still aren't well enough off to support them past the two and a half months of expenses? Is the loan still forgivable or only if you keep them for a period of a year or how long? So it's again, what they do is that they compare the average payroll that you had for during the eight weeks of the um, um, eight weeks after you got the loan, and then they look at the uh, previous the the what I this is the 2019 dates the 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 previous year essentially what did you do between the 25th of Feb 15th of February and uh, 30th of June in terms of the average payroll cost, and then they compare those two. So if you've already fired somebody and that puts your average headcount below where uh, you were in 2019 at that time in 2019, then they will pro return reduce the forgiveness amount. You still get the loan, but you don't get the forgiveness. 
Um, and there are some corner cases there around like, you know, seasonal workers and what if you weren't in business and, and all that stuff. But that's generally the thing. There isn't, there, there, like it's, it's, it's not about how long do you keep the employees on afterwards. It's not about, um, you know, do you need to bring back exactly the same person that you let go because maybe you fired a slacker because they were a slacker. <laughs> so you don't have to bring them back in order to get the forgiveness. What you do have to do effectively is to have a very similar you know, payroll that you did uh, during this measurement period, which is the uh, 15th of February to, to uh, 30th of June, 2019. Um, and so you can bring back, and there's like specifically a, um, there's specifically a sort of rehiring exemption, which if you basically already fired or reduced salaries below 25%, and that's the other thing, you can reduce salaries, but no more than on average 25%. And then everything below the 25% is, re, is re, comes off the loan forgiveness dollar for dollar. But if you already fired or reduced salaries, then you have until uh, 30 days until after they pass the bill um, to, to, to rehire those or, or undo those um, salary counts. Cool. All right. Um, let's do our third and final poll, which is, producer Xander can throw that up. When do you expect things to return to normal for your business and we have some date range never <laughs> that was i think Brent, we were chatting about this before and i had ranges and brandon's like what about the apocalypse <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. hopefully that's not like 20 percent of the raving say. gangs in the streets yeah yeah <laughs> now producer Xander, let me know when those are um when those are done, let's uh, take Andy Baldacci's question. How are new employee wages handled? We hired somebody full-time W-2 on March 1st, so just about a month ago. They were a contractor before for a few weeks starting on February 13th. February 13th. Um, I think it'd be, a, yeah, I think it'd be hard to, well, so they would count. It depends on when you make the loan. Again, so there's some really confusing because it's different dates things are different things. There's like, how do you count the period by which you average the payroll? And I believe that is like the 12 months prior to when you make the loan application. And then there's the time by which you're allowed to spend the money and, and qualif on, the, on the qualifying expenses and get the, uh, get the loan forgiveness if they're spent by, on, this, on the qualifying stuff. And that's, I think, is eight weeks after you get the loan. And then there are the comparison dates for salaries and um, salaries and uh, and headcount, which are fixed. Like they're fixed, fifteenth of February, June thirtieth. Those are the those are the dates they're looking at. So in this case, if you hired somebody uh, February, well, say that you hired somebody February fifteenth. If you applied for the loan now, they would count as part of the payroll up until you made the application. But obviously, it would be a minuscule amount because it's the average of the previous 12 months. All right. Very good. Uh, more questions. Brennan, do you want to throw anything at, at Einar? No, I, my, uh, I think, Einar, you just mentioned something that I was kind of thinking through, which was how, um, so let's say, I mean, theoretically, let's say you had uh, more people a year ago. And then more recently, you've downsized. So your salary were, you know, divided by 12 over the last year is actually, or your, your overall payroll is actually higher than potentially where you are today. Um, how much of the decision making is done solely by the bank? Are they going to rubber stamp you right then and there? Do they have the decision making authority or is it, are they just capturing your application and forwarding on to somebody at the SBA. Like, I guess what I'm getting at is, um, well, I, I kind of buried two questions in that. One of them is uh, <laughs> more around like, how much are they asking details on number of employees, number of paychecks cut, any of this stuff, or is it just, what's your lump sum of payroll overhead for the last year? That's question one. And I guess the second one is, um, in terms of the application process, this is something that's done on the spot. Is there, are they forwarding it to the government? Like, how does that work? So the banks, the, your, 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 first, your last question first. The banks are basically underwriting the loans, um, but it's guaranteed yeah. by the SBA. 
And right. so the banks will make their own, based on the guidance from the SBA, they will make their own determination as to what they need in order to uh, qualify somebody for the loan. And so that could, in theory, vary between banks. Um, you know, there's a standardized application form, but the supporting documents that they might request and, you know, which part they think qualify might differ from bank to bank because um, the, the way these things work is the SBA itself, the bank can be in a position where if they make, if they're too loose with the, with the, with the money, the SBA itself can deny them the forgiveness and, and then it becomes effectively, or, or it be, deny the, the, the backing that the SBA provides. And then it, it goes on the bank's books itself. Um, so this is why they're all waiting for guidance because they want to be super clear about what the SBA down the line will actually let them, let them uh, back. Because if they do it wrong, then the SBA will say, nope, that's not what we told you to do. That's tough. That's not your loan. We're not guaranteeing it anymore. Got it. And then... And is it... Oh, yeah, you had another question. Yeah, if you, if, you reduce more about, your, yeah. if you reduce your payroll, like if you went down, so if you had 100 employees in 2019 in this period, and now you have 50, then I think you might be shit out of luck. Right, right. Cool. All right, let's bring up results for poll three. That question was, when do you expect things to return to normal for your business? Producer Xander, nothing's changed, 5%. In the next two months, 5%, y'all are lucky. So 10% of folks in the next two months. 28% uh, two to five months, 44% six to 12 months. So definitely the majority um, or, or the, you know, the largest group in there. And then... Oh, there's just, are the numbers slightly different than what I'm looking at? Yeah, they're slightly off, but whatever. Uh, 44, 45%. And then uh, greater than a year, 16%, and never between 2 and 3%. So there we have it. Um, another question. There's a lot of questions coming in. We won't have time to get to all these for sure. There's still 102 open questions. Uh, question is, I'm a solo software contractor. So let's assume 1099. Um, do you know if your rent counts does my normal it does my normal income given to myself as payroll count that's a, i'm not sure this is I'm probably not sure a broad that, question yeah um i mean like the stuff that you pay yourself certainly qualifies as uh as part of the loan amount you can get now you and you are allowed to use the money for a rent payments that you've already established prior to february 15th um, but rent itself <clears throat> cannot be used for determining how much loan you can get, which is why I think it's kind of a poor bill for the Main Street brick and mortar businesses. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean, I originally thought this was for like grocery stores and and folks. And there is a question in here. Someone's like, I'm not, uh, you know, a bar or a restaurant or something that shut down. I'm we're just an R and D engineering firm. You know, do we qualify? And it's like that's that's the point of this whole thing is the the terms are written such that it's any business it's any u.s based business you know as long as it's, you... it's meant to i mean it's meant to be a stimulus effectively and like you know there was like i said there was some a fair amount of political back and forth about who should administer this grant because there's no uh, the system because there's there's no you know god-given law that says it has to be the sba and it has to be bank and intermediaries involved in theory the u.s treasury and the irs could decide that this is going to be a grant and we're going to look at you know, the, whatever you filed your taxes for 2019, and then, you know, we're going to kick you out of grant, and then we'll take it back in taxes if you fire people. Like, that would have been probably easier, um, but that's not the way they went. Taylor Pearson's asking, if you have a 1099 contractor on retainer, but they are not American, so I assuming he means they live abroad, does that count as payroll? Again, like, the 1099 is... A little bit up in the air and it's only really on the employee side that it definitely says the employee must be mostly a resident in the United States it does not say that for contractors but I'd be very surprised if they let 1099 foreign 1099s yeah. get paid but not foreign you know employee US employees based abroad now is that only for is that for the loan or for the forgiveness like would they give you the loan on a foreign you know employee but just just not forgiven or they just aren't gonna give the loan at all 
I can't actually remember with which of those two things in, but I would expect that they will not let them qualify as the loan amount. Seems like it, yeah. You'll, you, that, that'll be one you'll have to maybe dig in on yourself. Um, someone, Sophia Quintero is asking, which banks, any banks? Like, I assume there's only certain banks that apply to be part of this SBA program, is that right? There must be a list somewhere. So yeah, so now there's there's a there's a website called Lender Match, which we link to in the on the website, but um, which, which you can find SBA loans uh, banks uh, near you. Now, certainly that will be the easiest and the fastest, and those guys will start lending first because they're already approved and set up with the SBA. Now, what I've heard is that, uh, or you know, directly from the banks that I have relationships with, is that they're basically saying the SBA banks are saying, first we will do this for our existing customers. And then after that, we will take new customers. And so how long it's going to take for those guys to go through all their entire customer base and process all yeah. those loans? Who knows? And then yeah. the second piece of that, that is the Steve Nutrien says that you know any pretty much any FDIC insured bank should be able to issue these these loans. But you know, what's the process for getting those guys certified and set up? Who knows? That could also take a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's another question. If the owners typically pay themselves through a draw rather than through payroll, does that count as wages, commissions, blah, blah, blah? Um, and you had said earlier, it's a little bit gray, right? If it's a yeah. guaranteed that, you know, then it might, but yeah, it's kind of a, kind of a gray area. I have a sole LLC and I pay myself from this. No, no real issues that I can see. No, that's some well, the issue there is that aren't sole LLCs. You don't really have a concept of payroll, right? You just take money out. It's it's. Well, it depends. It's actually interesting. So I have a sole a solo LLC, but I'm set up. I file taxes as an S corp, and so I do have W two payroll. So I think it depends okay. on how you file taxes, really. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it. if, you, if you, you like, I run it through Gusto, you know. But in his case, yeah, if you're just pulling draws out, it's that gray area that keeps you know people people keep asking about. I, I think. I mean, I think that'll be somewhat reasonable. Um, you know, because the owner members are mentioning independent yeah. contractors and, and all this right. stuff and sole proprietors and sole proprietors, like there's no concept of a W-2, obviously. But the question is like, okay, say you're in, you know, a, a solo LLC who's been doing really well and you kicked out, you know, 100,000, say, as, you know, either W-2 salary or guaranteed payments, which which I think will most certainly will count for as a salary. But then you've also taken out other distributions above it, so another $100,000. Like, where does that fall? Like, is it the just, is it 100,000? Is it the full 200,000? And and again, I I wouldn't be surprised if they basically go back and say, you know, and, and and even if you're doing a solo LLC, like you have to pay some employer taxes or at least you know self-employment taxes. So mm -hmm. part of almost my hunch would be, and again, not a lawyer, my hunch would be that they'll end up in a position where like whatever it is you paid self-employment taxes on, that counts as your salary, which is kind of fair. <laughs> kind of makes sense, right? Yeah, it seems yeah. it seems odd yeah, that you basically for yeah. years we're like, well, you know, uh, this is my salary, this is my salary, the rest isn't my salary, and then, I'll, then now you're like, actually, all that was my salary. Yeah, it was my salary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's I like, feel like well, someone's gonna call you on that. Man, yeah. I don't know. Hey, Anar, where's that link to um, Lender Match? Is that in the PPP summary you wrote, or is it in yes. the COVID nineteen one? It's in. Okay, I'll, I'll post that in the chat because someone is asking about it. Uh, that's the PPP specific one. Yeah. So if you All go right. to down to the how to apply section, it says you can find the lenders through lender match and that's actually linked up. Right. And there, yeah, the, this document started relatively small and it's, it's growing <laughs> because you just keep, well, you keep getting questions and clarifications. So there's a great FAQ at the bottom of that. Obviously we're not, we know with 102 still open questions and just a couple minutes left, we're not going to be able to get through everything, but um, that's, that FAQ is, is pretty, uh, is pretty helpful. Uh, all right. Let's see. More questions. Are hourly part-time employees included in payroll cost? I think we touched on that earlier. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Not. Yeah, not sure. But this is the thing. If I were in your shoes and I was going to apply, y you apply, and then the bank is going to accept it or reject it. They're going to say, "Oh, part-time doesn't, or you know, doesn't count, or hourly doesn't count." I mean, that that's what's going to happen, right? Yep. All right. Um, there's a question about Upwork. You know, what if I hired someone through Upwork? And I don't, I mean, they certainly didn't address this in the document. So I think it's just no. speculation, right? 
So I actually think the, the what I the only thing I've heard about Upwork because it's come up obviously is I think it probably works because yeah. you, it's not when you're paying Upwork you're actually not paying Upwork the company you're paying Upwork escrow something something which is actually yeah. acts acts as an escrow and then the money goes to uh, you know the contractor so I think I actually think it probably will. With if the the contractor payments are already you know are, are are across the board are being accepted now of course the you know where the contractor is and stuff will still apply. Sounds good. Um, the yeah, there's a couple there's a couple questions people are asking like I haven't paid myself anything. Can I start paying myself now? And the answer is no, right? That doesn't count because you it can through February. You can because it 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 counts 12 from months, right? 12 months prior yeah. to when you applied oh, okay. um but you basically but if you get a it, week of payroll in then your amount is divided by 12 in now <laughs> and then gamble that like okay there'll be plenty of money so give yourself a month and a half and then they play sometime in june and but then you'd still end up with like a month and a half divided by 12 so you know yeah it'll be it's i mean the max you can do is eight eight thousand three hundred thirty three. Yeah. so that's ten thousand so divided by you know, divide by 12. Right. Uh, I mean, it, it, well, it, to, to, as a kind of counter example, that could work if you, if you're doing, if you've got enough in the bank, because one thing that I've always done historically has been paid myself a minimum salary W2 with my S corp. And I would hold it off till the last week of the year. So I would do draws throughout the year. And at the end of the year, I do a big W2. That would be the sufficient enough not to raise any red flags with the IRS amount that my um, <laughs> yeah. accountant would give me. And I wouldn't do biweekly or monthly paychecks. Instead, it would be one big W-2 payment near the end of the year. Um, so, I mean, uh, theoretically, I guess you could do a few. I guess you could, yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, that 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 might work. Um, might set off a red flag if they want. I think, <laughs> yeah. Line I think item you stuff, might be like inviting, a, inviting an audit, maybe. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what is the maximum loan amount? Uh, ten million. Is it that big? I thought it was two. No, that's the EIDL. Okay. The yeah, maximum amount is ten complicated. million. All yeah, right. EIDL well, I think that we are going to start heading to wrap up. I want to thank um, Brennan and Anar for showing up and hanging out for an hour, um, representing. And, uh, you know, hopefully bringing a lot of value. What I've, what I've been seeing in the chat is people saying like, this is super helpful. Like, thanks so much for doing it. Um, so I, I feel like, I feel like this was valuable for folks. And again, you know, as I said at the top, like none of us are lawyers, we're doing the best we can to interpret this stuff, but obviously there's a lot of gray areas and a lot of different situations and you really are going to want to research it. Um, and potentially, you know, read the part of the bill or, or contact your bank. Like if your bank is part of the SBA program, it's really a question for them, technically, you know, them, the SBA and the, and the United States government, ultimately everything else is, is really, you know, just our interpretation. So if you want to keep up with Brennan Dunn, he is at Brennan Dunn on Twitter and rightmessage.com is the app he's working on every day. And, uh, Anar Volset is all, he's Anar Volset on Twitter working on tiny seed with me, um, Anything you guys want to say as we close? No, this has been super helpful for me. I mean, as a studio <laughs> attendee, I mean, this has been great. Like I, I yeah. So thank you. I'm, I'm just, yeah. I, I'm just glad to bring it out to people because I, I started looking at it because I was like, wait, this is confusing as hell. I don't understand. Nobody seems to know what they're talking about. So um, it's good, it's good right. to get it out there. And you started reading it and you threw it in the tiny seed slack and people are like, oh my gosh, this is so helpful. And we're like, oh wait, I wonder if there are <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of other companies who also need to help. So, exactly. Um, well, you know, fundraising yeah. is freeze now. So it's not, I, yeah. I have time on my hands, you know, other yeah. than yeah. I'm homeschooling yeah. and reading SBA docs. That's what I'm doing. That's fun. That sounds so fun. You want to so, take a folks, crack at the Code of Federal Regulations next? No. That's what it is. No. <laughs> No. microconf.com slash latest is where anar is cranking out new info and putting new summaries together there's still several other kind of loan grant programs that that he hasn't done full write-ups of um you can obviously get on our email list at microconf.com or if you follow microconf.com uh slash latest that's kind of the the blog output and and the latest that's going on with us 
Um, so to everyone out there, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope this was helpful. And um, we, you know, we hope that you and your families and, and your communities are able to stay healthy in these uh, coming months and you know, maintain your business and, and keep pushing it forward um, and fighting the good fight. So thanks, y'all. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.